Have you ever entered the Nigerian grocery store to buy condensed milk? You discover that you have three crown, you have uh, coast, you have Olandia picnic, among several other products. Okay, the other thing is you are likely to be an economic student or someone who takes economics in one way or the other, or then perhaps you just want to see uh, this video for the sake of seeing it. But then if you happen to be an economic student, you are likely to have come across several economics textbook, textbooks. Okay, some um, one written by Mankiw, Mankiw, another one by Lipson Crystal, another one Case and Fair, other ones would be a Blanchard. Um, Frank and Bernanke and so on and so forth. Now, what you then discover is that these textbooks they provide general information concerning um, economics as far as economics is concerned, but they are distinct in one way or the other. Okay, one book could attract you because of its design, its cover, and so on and so forth. The other book could attract you in form of the graphs that are that are drawn therein. Another book could attract you in form of the number of case studies that it has, so that you know that economics is actually practical, like it's actually a practical course, and you could just learn it in order to uh, make uh, policies in one way or the other. Then another one could be you could like um, another textbook, okay, simply because of. Um, the calculations in it, it has a lot of um, questions that deal with calculations here and there and then you make use of it to master your calculations. And all of these textbooks, what we discover is that they provide general information concerning the subjects of economics, but then they are unique in their own way. Okay, one other thing I want uh, that you must have probably observed is that they command different prices. If you have um, two textbooks whose prices are the same, that is likely to be a coincidence. It's not as if the authors planned it or they co-planned it or something like that. Now, um, in what kind of market structure do we have um, that type of product where the product is um, the product the products that you find they are similar, okay, but they are not the same in the sense that one could uh, pick one over the other. Okay, that is one could have a textbook as his favorite or not. Um, while keeping the rest as big. So if you could have a favorite among all of these textbooks, it simply means that they are not the same. Because if they were the same in the first place, why would you have a favorite? Now uh, this also, this brings us to today's topic, which we call monopolistic competition. Before now, we've talked about the privately competitive market and we also talked about the monopoly. You see, in the privately competitive market, there is a very strong competition in such a way that firms end up becoming price takers. And then under the monopoly, there is no competition at all. It's just one supplier. Okay, and um, that single supply is facing the industry demand curve in such a way that the industry demand curve happens to be the firm's uh, demand curve as well. And then this firm makes um, makes its uh, pricing and uh, quality decision based on the intersection of the marginal revenue and the marginal cost as well as the demand uh, for facing it. So we have other uh, market structures such as the one I mentioned, the one that sells different textbooks, okay, and then different kind of condensed milk and um, other kind of product like that, and as well as um, oligopoly, duopoly, and any other market structure that is different from privately competitive market and uh, monopoly in between um, these two extremes. You see, private competition is an extreme point where competition is uh, so tight that uh, firms can't do anything about the price that they sell their products. Now, monopolistic competition is simply where uh, we have the monopoly is where there is no competition at all and the firm to a large degree has uh, market power. If you want to learn more about product market and monopoly, you can check the link under the, in the description of this particular video. Okay, that leads to there. We treated uh, product market um, from part one to part four in a way that is uh, very explicit enough for others to understand. And then monopoly, because of its uh, broadness, okay, it's broad, we have to treat um, monopoly from part one to part six. All right, so just have a just um, click on the link the, just click the links below and then you are good to go now all those um, market structures that fall in between these two extremes that is the private market as well as the monopoly they are called the imperfect uh, competition okay the imperfectly competitive um, markets all right and that is where you have the uh, monopolistic competition oligopoly and so on and so forth now let's talk about monopoly because what we are going to do, but let's talk about monopolistic competition because this that is what this video is all about. It introduces us to the concept of monopolistic competition. Now this is a market structure with some elements of power competition and a monopoly. Yeah, so, with some elements of power competition and um, a and a monopoly. Okay, so what are the features? One, there are many firms competing 
for the same bias. Exactly, just like uh, the textbook scenario that I painted earlier, okay, there are many uh, firms competing for the same bias. You have different textbooks, and then the bias of economics textbooks happen to be the same. So each seller is trying his best in order to uh, capture as many buyers as uh, possible. Now, two, there is entry and exit to some degree. You know, in the perfect market, there is free entry and exit. Anyone can enter, anyone can leave. And then in the other monopoly, there is no entry and exit. That's why we just have a single firm. When there's entry and exit, okay, it's no longer a monopoly. All right. So we have the monopolistic competition being in between. Okay, it has some form of um, entry, and ex ex um, entry and exit. It is not entirely, it's not entirely free. Okay, like the like under the market, like under the perfect uh, competition. Now, what do I mean by saying that it is not entirely free? You see. Uh, which is not entirely free because of the initial cost of setting up a business under this market structure. So if you have a kind of business where the fixed cost is significantly high, we tend, up, we tend to have um, few um, firms in the industry. I'm talking about monopolistic um, um, competition now. We tend to have few firms in the industry. And then if you have uh, other uh, businesses, uh, other businesses under monopolistic competition, where the fixed cost is not as great, is not so significant like that, we tend to have several firms. Now, when I'm talking about several firms and few firms, I wanted to know that I'm not talking about the absolute value because a thousand firms could be um, several, could be many in some cases, and then 10 firms could be uh, many in another case. So we, when we say we, they have there are many uh, firms, there are many suppliers, there are many producers. It is kind of a relative uh, concept. Okay. Now, goods are differentiated and similar but not the same. Okay. And in that case, um, close, uh, goods are close but imperfect substitutes. The goods are differentiated in one way or the other. So we are going to talk about this point later on. When I was talking about the condensed milk, there is peak milk, uh, Hollandia peak milk, there is... Um, there is a um, coast, um, there is three crown, and several other brands of um, pick, uh, of um, condensed milk that you could see. Okay, so these goods are in one way or the other, they are not that the same, or they are not that the same exactly. They are similar, but they are not that the same. Okay, it might be in the taste, it might be in the packaging, it might be in some other way. So these goods are differentiated, and that has to be the case because you see. There are many firms and these firms are competing for the same number of buyers. So they just have to do something to their product that make them unique. Okay, and make them unique and make them uh, stand out among their um, competitors, all right, and to gain um, the uh, markets. Okay, so firms face downward sloping demand curve, and this is what makes a monopolistic competitor similar to a monopolist. So in this case, there is a downward sloping demand curve, and what does that tell us? What does that tell us? That simply tells us that these um, firms here can set their prices where um, uh, and then their prices are greater than their marginal cost. That is, marginal cost intersects the marginal revenue. We use that to get the quantity, then trace that up upwards towards uh, the demand curve to get the uh, price that the monopolistic competitor is going to charge. But the case here is that um, you see the ability of a monopolist, of a monopolistic competitor to raise uh, price, to charge the price that's greater than the marginal cost, is not as great as that of a monopolist. It is greater than that of a primary competitive firm, but it's not as great as that of uh, the monopolist. And when we are talking about market power, market power is just the um, characteristics of a firm being able to charge prices above its marginal cost in a way that it makes profit. All right, in a way that it makes profit. So we have firms here, their products are differentiated so they can increase their price above the marginal cost and then they are not going to lose many of their customers. Okay, since the products are unique, we have customers that are going to be loyal to um, their brand. Okay, and then we have um, customers that will just like the quality of their products instead of other products and that gives a monopolistic competitor the advantage of raising price above the marginal cost. That is the advantage of uh, making profit and exhibiting market power to some degree. Now you see the curve, the, the, the demand curve is downward sloping simply because um, a monopolistic competitor has market uh, power to some degree but then it cannot raise price insignificantly high. Okay, a textbook, um, an economic textbook could cost um, 10,000, 20,000 as the case may be, but then there is a certain threshold that the price must not get to that. Consumers would just forget that there is a textbook like that at all and just go for uh, the, the, uh, the close substitute, other goods, that um, other, um, other textbooks uh, that um, other firms are producing in the market. So uh, when the price is low, it is um, expected, um, serious variables that um, more quantity is going to be sold and when the price is high it is also expected that um, less quantity is going to be sold compared to when the price was low. Alright, so 
that explains why the demand curve is that was sloping. And number five, buyers and sellers have imperfect information. Okay, so when we talk about imp imperfect information in the first case, that simply means everyone in the market knows what everyone knows. It's as simple as that. Everyone in the market knows what everyone knows. The seller does not have more information than the buyer, and the buyer does not have less information than the seller. Okay, so that is exactly what happens. Now, we expect typically that um, for a, as far as the product is concerned, that the, the seller of the product, the producer of the product, should know more about the product. Now, that may be the case, and that may not be the case. Okay, and then the buyers may know what is happening in the market, in the industry, even more than um, the seller. So, there is a kind of possibility of that happening under this market structure. Number six, farms and price setters with some degree of market power have explained that. Okay, so we just keep the point. Number seven, there is non price competition in terms of product quality. Product appearance, product packaging, product style. So this point comes. This point is just an um, expansion of the other points, which is um, here. Okay, that goods are differentiated. So goods are differentiated in what way? They could be differentiated in terms of the quality, in terms of um, the appearance of the product, in terms of the packaging, in terms of the style, and other means of differentiating this uh, product. Now you see, you may decide to buy uh, bathing soap, and then you get into the market and discover that there are brands like Joy. There are uh, brands like um, Lux, Lux Everything Soap. You have um, 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 Premier Cool as well as other brands. Now, okay, you could decide to buy Joy because just like it Saints, all right, and that is talking about our quality in this sense. You like the sense of Joy, you just, you just, you just, you just love it, and because of that, you would always go for the Joy Soap. Okay, that simply means that um, the the um, firm producing Joy Soap has successfully distinguished its products from other products in terms of the smell that customers perceive from the product. Now, you see, the sellers of Lux soap, the buyers of Lux soap could just decide that, okay, I would, I, 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 I would stick to Lux soap because to me, it's, it's durable. Okay, durable is saying that it lasts longer. Okay, so that is what is perceived by the consumer that it lasts longer. Okay, so the firms producing, um, the firms producing Lux soap has, um, in that way, um, um, promoted an image for themselves of, of selling uh, bathing soaps that uh, last longer and so on and so forth. Have you ever tried to buy two products that offer the same service, okay, or the same satisfaction and then you, there's one product that um, the seller is trying to convince you to buy that it has this quality, that quality, that quality and so on and so on, but then too, it is not just attractive no, it is just, just attractive at all. Then you see this other product that is just so attractive and because of its attractiveness, you decide to buy it. Now, the thing is, you see the first product that is not as attractive may even be better in terms of quality than the one that is attractive, but that is just you. Okay, You want to like to go home with the ugly good, you like to go home with the uh, beautiful good. So, in that case, we say that um, a firm, okay, the firm producing the beautiful good has been able to distinguish itself in terms of beauty, in terms of appearance. So, in one way or the other, firms do things like that so that they are going to have um, more buyers for their products so that they are going to have a larger uh, market size for their uh, products okay so that is why they engage in this um, kind of um, um, dif um kind of um, non-price and competition so it's not just about okay let me let me make my product cheaper let me make uh, my products more expensive no it's not about that so firms under monopolistic competition what they do mostly is to differentiate themselves in terms of the products that they are producing, be it service or, uh, or a good. Now, number eight, firms are getting advertisement and branding to improve sales. Now, firms, when we talk about advertisement, that is to create awareness for um, the consumer, so that, hey, this particular commodity is here, come and buy, okay, this particular service is being rendered here, come and buy, and so on and so forth. Now, branding is simply the creation of a reputation for a particular product, okay? So when we talk about advertisement, you see firms here could even spend as high as uh, millions of um, dollars in order to bring in a celebrity that would help them promote their product. For example, how do you feel if you are in love of Cristiano Ronaldo and you then see him um, drinking a bottle of Pepsi, or you are in love of Messi and then you see Messi putting on a certain type of shoes, okay? So you're like, wow, that's what I know, I, I really like that guy, if he could be 
wearing Pepsi, okay, fine. If, if it could be, sorry, if it could be um, drinking uh, Pepsi, okay, that's fine. I think drinking Pepsi is going to make me look um, more handsome. At least, you know, Christian Ronaldo to be, an, to be a handsome man. Okay, so if Pepsi is what he's drinking to make him mass, I think I should start taking more Pepsi. Okay, and then you see um, Lionel Messi posting on um, attractive shoes, and you're like, okay, if that is what uh, brings him all of the fame and all of that, I think I should just buy that shoe. You know, you just have people with funny perspectives like that, and then you will find that these firms are able to convince you one way or the other that come and buy this product and so on and so forth. So firms do that and that is also to increase their market share is to, for them to make more profit in the market. Remember that the, the, the firms under this um, type of industry are many so each firm is going to try its best in order to make sure that it is making profit and it is making supernormal profit even at that. Now when we talk about branding, that's talking about the reputation of, that's hinges on the reputation of the firm. So, so a firm could have a reputation of uh, providing, okay, let me talk about phones, for example, let me talk about phones, okay. So if you love Samsung phones, you probably know about its camera quality, okay, you love um, Samsung phones because of its camera quality. So they've created a reputation for themselves, they've created a brand for themselves. Um, based on camera quality. If you have a lover of techno phone, if you like techno phone because of its battery life, okay, because they have strong batteries and so on and so forth, then those ones have successfully created a brand image of um, long lasting uh, batteries. So if you are a lover of maybe say, let, let, let's say Nokia phones, okay, okay, Nokia phones could have, um, could, um, have a reputation, a brand image of internal memory, large internal memory, okay, maybe there's this small phone that just comes around and then it's not so expensive but then it has 32 gig inner memory and then a space for uh, an external SD card, and you're like, wow, okay, so if these uh, firms have created this kind of brand image for themselves, it's going to be disappointing for you to try to buy, for you to buy a Samsung phone and then discover that it's camera quality is bad. You've known Samsung for good camera quality, but then you bust this particular one and then it's supposed to be bad. So, um, apart from the fact that um, these firms try to promote uh, their brands, okay, try to promote them, so try to create a reputation for themselves, it only takes a single error from them in order to um, make them bankrupt sometimes. Okay, if when you buy a particular commodity and then it's quite that it is not as expected, this is not uh, this is not what this firm used to do, this is not what we expect from this firm, that may just ring them. And you know, this is a world of social media, so a so customer just goes up there to the website and just types something, I'm disappointed in this product, blah, 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 like that, then you discover that other consumers or potential consumers when they see the comments, they bought, they do not bother, or they are likely not to bother to even purchase that phone. Okay, they've not purchased one. They've not checked if was the um, um, customer that bought the first one. I said it's true, but then just because of that comment, okay, it's not just a good. So um, branding is very very good because it promotes um, it promotes the business. Then it it brings in more revenue and it's um, it's uh, it's. Um, promotes the business to potential uh, customers as well um, as soon as well. But then it only takes a single mistake to bring everything down. So firms here, they make, uh, uh, they, they try their best in order to make sure that the brand, the image that they are projecting outside there to their customers do not get to bring for anything. They need to do that because remember, there are many firms under this market structure. So firms have to do anything they can do in order to generate the money. Okay, now number nine, firms may also engage in product pro proliferation. So when we're talking about product proliferation, it's, it's just talking about creating different brand of a particular product. So we are going to talk about this more in um, one of our videos, um, subsequent, in one of our subsequent videos, still under monopolistic competition and then you discover that you know what we are talking about in the real sense of it. So if firm has a particular product, product A and then it has different types of products A. Okay, so that is what we are talking about and that is in order to gain uh, market share as uh, as well. Now number 10, firms make only zero economic profit in the long run. You know, there is entry and exit in this particular, um, in this particular market, under this particular market structure. So uh, the, the, although the entry and exit, they are not so they are not so free, okay, but that doesn't still remove the fact that there is um, entry and exit. So if firms are making um, supernormal profits in the short run, we then expect that more firms that are capable of um, 
investing more than the fixed cost of um, um, starting up, uh, or more than the fixed cost of um, um, starting up the business in this particular uh, market structure. We expect them to come in uh, for the sake of reaping the reaping part of the profits, the profit that was existing in the short run. So as more firms come in, we discover that they then erode the profits for which they came for at the, uh, um, in the first instance, and then start to operate where um, they are. The market of just tangential to the average cost. You know, we take that from perfect market, but then there is a difference between what actually happens in the perfect market and what actually happens here in the long run. The similarity is there is going to be zero economic profit, but then there is a dissimilarity as well that we shall be talking about later. All right, then if the if firms were making losses, okay, in the short run, the marginal firm is going to leave the market um, is going to leave the industry, and then what is then observed is that you see. Firms that were um, that firms that did not leave the industry, they are the ones that would be um, experiencing a reduction in their losses. Okay, so they will keep experiencing a reduction in their losses until they get to that point where there is just zero economic profit. That is, no profit, uh, no loss. Now, I explained in one of my videos that zero economic profit does not simply mean that the firm is really uh, is not really making any money. Okay, and thousand hours differentiating between economic profit and accounting profit because what is what is reported in um, the annual report, statement of accounts, and all of that is accounting profit. So a firm that is making zero economic profit could still be making billions of dollars as um, its accounting uh, profit. So they could still announce in that particular year they made billions of dollars. And that's simply uh, because um, economic profit takes into consideration implicit cost, but then we have accounting profits not taking into consideration implicit cost. So for you to differentiate between implicit and explicit cost, we have a video on that which you could just um, check out. We try our best to explain them as easy as easily as possible. So we've come to the end of this video. In our next video, we shall be talking about long run and the short run of a monopolistic competitor to see the kind of things that happen and so on and so forth. So thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. I remain Oluwole Godwin. This is Emoji Economics.